My name's Wayne Walker, um, one of the Auckland councillors and coincidentally the chair of the Council's Environment and Sustainability Forum. It gives me an immense amount of pleasure to welcome Mike here today, Mike Reynolds, and also to welcome all of you. What Mike is going to present, I think, is incredibly important for the space and time that we're in right now. The Council's working through its unitary plan, it's working through a bundle of other things, and if we can't build a 10-star Earthship, frankly, we've got problems. So we need to be able to do it, and we need to shift heaven and earth to make sure that we can. Not simply because of the Earthship and the technology and putting together a fantastic home that meets all of the requirements around 10 star, but as much as anything, because what's embodied in it encompasses a range of technologies that are going to be relevant to all sorts of construction, irrespective of whether it's a more conventional construction or whether it's right out there. So this is directly relevant to where we are now. I'd also like to acknowledge the funders I don't know who all the funders are. I'm sure some of them are from Auckland Council, maybe solid waste, maybe design, maybe unitary plan. I don't know. I know certainly that there have been a lot of people that have attended the workshops, the seminars that Mike has run so far in New Zealand. I don't know where Mike is going after this, but I know he's been down in Christchurch before and no doubt had some impact there. So can you all put your hands together for Mike? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for being interested in this. Uh, I'm going to show you briefly what we have come up with uh, from 40 years of work in sustainability and a lot of global travel. But more important than, than what we've come up with for this uh, meeting is how we were able to come about it and, and I think that's the issue that I see all over the world is that, you know, it's, the solutions are out there. They're not even rocket science. It's how we get these solutions into our reality and through our dogma. And that has, that's a problem in every developed country. The third world countries don't have a problem with that. Um, but the developed countries do. We have encountered or, or we have stumbled onto a few uh, situations, let's say, that have made it so we could do this. And that's, that's what I'm really going to present to you today. Um, the thing that the product, let's call it, is what we call the Global Model Earthship. It's a building that does everything for itself uh, without any infrastructure needs or nuclear power plant needs or uh, it, it takes care of people. It provides sustenance for people without being hooked up to anything. It, we call it the Earthship. Uh, some people would rather not have that name. That's okay. We're talking about the concept of the thing. Uh, but we have done them all over the world. This just shows uh, a few places around the world noting that uh, that uh, the Netherlands and France and all over the US and Canada are on there and many many more but the building is a it's a form what I call it is a formula building it's a building it has to be a formula building because it's providing electricity it's providing water it's containing and treating sewage on site it's providing food it's using byproducts of our society i.e. garbage uh, what we call garbage and um, it is taking these things and putting them, it's, it's addressing all of these issues. Actually, these issues are, are six issues that, from traveling around the world, I'm seeing that every country and every city is dealing with water. They're dealing with contained sewage treatment, not in a very good way in most cases. Uh, food, uh, garbage. And we use what we call recycled materials on this planet for uh, uh, their, their natural resources uh, at this point. And then 
heating and cooling the buildings without fuels, and electricity. These six issues are, are what every city and country is having to deal with. We're trying to at least address them in one package, uh, sustainable building that provides sustenance for people without uh, needing any conventional utilities. Because the, the way people go about getting these, uh, dealing with these things is usually not really appropriate for the planet uh, or even appropriate for people for that matter. You know, case in point, uh, municipal water systems usually have fluoride and chlorine. It's not really that good for you. It's really bad for you, in fact. Rainwater is okay and better than okay, and these buildings harvest rainwater. Uh, and on every level, these buildings deal with things on their own. Just the basic configuration of the building is very simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a structural uh, component that uses automobile tires rammed with earth uh, as a thermal mass unit. It's not necessary that you use that. You can use concrete. You can use any form of thermal mass. But we use that because we're trying to address all of these issues. and. Uh, garbage that is thrown away on this planet is one of these issues. Uh, briefly, the, the building uh, harvests sun and it's get, it gets stored in uh, the thermal mass walls that uh, because of the aspect of physics that heat goes to the cooler place, these cooler mass walls, tire wall with thermal storage, uh, more compacted earth behind it, uh, the buildings absorb energy and store it. Thermal mass stores energy. Uh, at night, when the building starts to cool down from heat loss out, the double glazing here and the double glazing here, um, when this airspace gets cooler than the uh, structural mass space, which is insulated away from the outside, uh, because of physics, the temperature leaks out into the space the warm temperature leaks out into the space. In, the, in a hot situation in summer, the sun is higher, the greenhouse gets hot, heat escapes. Uh, when heat is escaping, air is escaping, you can't have a vacuum, so um, it sucks air in from someplace else. We provide tubes, the hot air goes through the earth, gets cooled down, and it's an air conditioning system done with convection, subtle but effective, and uh, it's also fresh air movement. So these buildings, and I'm not explaining them in depth now because I want to go into why or, or how they were able to evolve. Uh, these buildings take on a lot of configurations and looks, but basically it's a formula building, providing its hot water, its electricity, and as the previous diagram showed, its heating and cooling, using recycled materials uh, that really are indigenous to the entire planet, like automobile tires, aluminum cans, glass bottles, plastic bottles are indigenous to the entire planet. They, they are everywhere. I have been no place on this planet that does not have those things in abundance. So why not use them? So there's, a, there's basically a lecture into every one of these issues, but this is just giving you a quick overview of what we have come up with. I'm really going to talk about how. Uh, interiors of these buildings are fairly normal looking. Uh, this is showing you this buffer zone greenhouse that, where all the heat comes in, and it does require you to orient your building a certain way. This is illustrating the food production, which is also gray water treatment. Everything is meshed together like your body systems. Your body is a sack of water. It's, it's really, that's all it is, with some systems. Uh, the systems are all interrelated and work together. Your body looks the way it does because of the systems that make it up. These buildings are the same way. They are a machine that, that because of its function, it causes it to look a certain way. Uh, in severe climates, we even add a third uh, glass face, which makes a second greenhouse. And these buildings, because they provide everything for themselves, uh, if you're going to do a village or a s small town or even a city, 
You don't have to put in infrastructure. Every city I have been into, uh, and I'm traveling the world constantly, um, they're, you know, they're worried about their future in terms of where are we going to continue to get water? How are we going to continue to treat sewage? Uh, where are we going to continue to get power? So there, everybody knows there are alternatives needed. What we see is there are barriers to bring those alternatives to the forefront and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, this series of pictures is showing this same type of building put together in a village situation. This is endless if you want it to be. It can go all the way up hills and all the way down and as long as you want. That's why there's bicycle lanes on the, on the black water treatment areas. But to start a village like this, you don't need multi-billion dollar uh, infrastructure of power, water, and sewage. Every building is independently doing everything for itself. So it opens all kinds of doors for uh, future development, and it's the direction we have to go. The question is, how do we let ourselves do it? Uh, so this is uh, the endless version of this concept. Now, just to give you a little bit of perspective, we have done it all over the world, individual buildings, but this is Brighton, England, and we did a compound of these that got approved by council, believe it or not. And here they are. Um, they actually got financing and got started excavation. Uh, and then dinosaur bones were discovered right here, and it put the whole project on hold. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Uh, but the buildings, um, are constantly being built. They're, they're, they're uh, biospheres, really, mini biospheres. They, they basically make it so you don't need anything else. Uh, this, people always ask us, okay, how do you do these on a multi-level basis in an urban area? This is our answer to that. This was for a college campus in China. Um, everybody all contractors in all cities know how to build a parking garage, uh, beefed up for earthquake if, if it needs to be. And so you build a parking garage, but we call it a land assemblage, so that we're basically building land. This can be three stories like this or 20 stories. The plans for these global model earthships, we call them, are then inserted into this as many levels as you want and they build out the same as they do out in a rural area. Uh, so you're building buildings on a land assemblage, and that's how you can get multi-story applications of this. Again, each one of these three buildings on these three levels is absolutely independent. It makes all of its own power water, contains all of its own sewage, grows food, uses recycled materials, uh, it's just a way of implementing this on a more urban level uh, to answer the question, uh, how do you do this in an urban situation? Um, there are various floor plans. They come in any sizes. Uh, studio versions, three bedroom, two bath versions. Uh, they are simply a formula home. Uh, the interiors can look quite normal. This is a recent build that's not quite done. Maybe it is done by now in Montana. Um, Laskiti Island in BC, British Columbia. Uh, these buildings simply work anywhere because they both cool and heat themselves. Anywhere there's sun, anywhere there's rain, anywhere there's garbage, uh, anywhere there's people, these buildings will work. So the question is, how were we able, Scotland, uh, trying to make it look a more like the stone castles in Scotland, France, Holland, and another important factor is this is the this is a graph of the coldest temperature we get in New Mexico. This is a performance graph of these buildings, not done by us, done by a professor in uh, Adelaide in Australia. Uh, the the temperatures are uh, in Fahrenheit on the right, Celsius on the left. So it gets severely cold where this was tested in the winter and quite hot in the summer. 
This is outdoor temperature, this is outdoor temperature, winter and summer. This is the temperatures in the house, winter and summer, blue being winter, orange being summer. Almost a straight line with no fuel, no backup, no, what, no fuel whatsoever. Uh, this is because of the thermal mass. This is because, really this is because we were able to play with this for 40 years. Uh, and that's, that's the point of today's discussion, is why, why and how we were able to play with this for 40 years. This is another graph by the same guy doing every kind of method of building he could find. And he just did it to see what would happen. And he didn't plan it this way, but this is how it happened. These are kilowatt hours of uh, uh, hypothetical uh, usage of energy for every type of building and he has this global model earthship on the very top. It came out that way. He didn't, he just wanted to see. We've taken that also because in our travels around the world we've realized that everybody can't afford a conventional mortgage. Uh, there are 80% of the people on the planet can't even think about that and we're usually only addressing the 20% uh, of the people on the planet in the developed world. When you travel the world, you see 80% of the people are not in the developed world and they need to be accommodated too. So we have what we call a simple survival version of this. Uh, uh, really performs exactly the same way for a fraction of the cost. Doesn't even come close to passing local codes and regulations in terms of systems. Whereas the other building, the global model, has passed codes and regulations pretty much all over the world. Still, it's heavily scrutinized because it's different. Because it's unusual, really. So this is the, the very simple version of this. And I've shown you the, the more, con if, if that's the right word, conventional version of this to use. Um, the conventional version, the global model we call it, does pass codes. It's aimed at passing codes. Um, this version provides people with the same amenities, the same sustenance, but doesn't pass codes, which has shown me that codes are part of the reason, regulations and codes are part of the reason of the cost of housing. And we need to like address, we need to look at that is all I'm saying. Uh, what is really necessary? And this is the way of life in one of the simple survivals, which, which is uh, a fraction, a, a mere fraction of the cost of the, of the conventional version. <coughs> so what I'm <coughs> uh, going to talk about then is why, how we were able to come about this. It was accidental at first. Everything that we have done has been accidental at first. This is 40 years ago, more than in New Mexico. Uh, responding to media uh, broadcasts about garbage and clear-cutting timber and future energy shortages, this is 40 years ago, I had a piece of land. It turned into a research compound. That's the point. We need research compounds. I got away with a research compound, you know, adding greenhouses, building stairways out of bottles. These are the old steel cans before they even made the aluminum cans. Uh, just building, building stuff uh, without any code and regulation issues 40 years ago in New Mexico. I didn't go to New Mexico because there were no codes and regulations. I found myself there after architectural school and uh, it turned out to be you know, a sort of a free zone to try out stuff. So I ended up with a research compound at that time, not even knowing it was a research compound, uh, building a lot of strange things, playing with solar gain, uh, greenhouses, and like I say, bottles and cans and all kinds of things. Uh, mainly it was a, a research situation, uninhibited, unencumbered by codes and regulations. Nobody cared in New Mexico. Uh, it was an accidental situation. But we were able to perfect and explore. This, these, are, these are panel walls made of beer cans laid in cement. They work just as good as bricks and they are something we're trying to get rid of. So we were trying to use them. Bottle walls, can walls. Uh, so this compound was, when I look back, 
it was an accidental research compound. Tires being used, stuffed with dirt. We later have evolved into pounding them with dirt to the point where they're uh, a 300 pound thermal mass brick encased in steel belted rubber. Uh, they're, they're better than adobe, they're better than rammed earth. The reason they're better is because they're encased in steel belted rubber. But early versions, I mean, who would even think of permitting something like this? We were able to do it and accidentally get away with it. Uh, first buildings made of these stuffed tires, now we, like I say, we pound them to the point where they're just, they're bricks. And we have engineers that have done analysis on them, uh, structurally, coefficient of friction, bearing weight, uh, all kinds of things. They have actually put it on the cover of a study for what structures in the future will be more uh, resistant and resilient to earthquake seismic uh, activity. Uh, so these buildings on this compound were uh, trying and playing. Basically it was almost like playing with all of these materials. And this is 40 years ago, so in New Mexico, and it turned out to be a learning experience. And much of this information we still use today. This, this, even from this very first compound, the things that I learned, I am still using today and putting into buildings that meet uh, uh, codes and regulations all over the world. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not had almost a decade on this compound free to study, to explore. That's what I'm hitting is where do we get to explore housing? We have racetracks that are off somewhere to explore the speeds of new car design. We test airplanes and people die sometimes. Uh, we certainly test drugs and you, you can certainly, you know, on television they tell you about the drugs, it's gonna cause your eyes to bleed and everything else, but you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take care of this for you. We're testing drugs on humans as we speak. So we test all these other things. I'm saying, where is the place that we can test methods of sustainable living? Where is it? It doesn't exist. That's why we're still living the same way. So compound two, again, an accident. The only reason I left compound one is because New Mexico was growing up around me and it was getting a little weird there, you know, uh, for these buildings. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to blow my cover or anything like that. So I went out further into the desert and did research compound two. This is 30 years ago. Uh, so these are buildings that, uh, sketches for a building that harvest wind and, and do photovoltaics and, uh, you know, playing with vertical axis windmills and, and beer cans and tires and learning what I, taking what I learned on compound one and taking it further. And yes, I had to go out further into the desert to take it further, uh, you know, and I, I have kept doing that really. Uh, so this is a compound, there was nothing out there, so nobody cared. And it's a, this is a building, not marketable, but uh, catches wind, sun, uh, thermal, solar heating, hot water, grows food. It was a compound. I built it myself uh, with friends and uh, for minimal amount of money and I lived there with no bills. You know, I was free. You know, you know actually what happened in this building is I'm still, you know, fairly young then and uh, I'm like living in this building and I'm like, I got no bills. You know, I have a life. Um, so not only do I have a life, I'm not really destroying the planet in, in, in my life. The reason people destroy the planet is because they don't have time to do anything else except make the mortgage payment and pay the utility bills and certainly don't have time to fight through the codes for three years to get a permit. I've got people that, are, that have come into my office and fought for three years to get a permit. I mean, I had a guy with a, he had white hair, old guy, and uh, had an oxygen tank on his back. And I'm thinking, he says, I want an earthship. And I'm saying, why do you want an earthship? You're going to be dead soon. <laughs> and he fought for three years with the oxygen tank on his back in Pima County, Arizona, to get a permit to build an earthship. 
you know, and, and he finally got it, and it cost three times as much and took four times as long. That's what the codes and regulations do. It's nobody's fault, but that's what I see them doing. They are stopping, inhibiting, holding up evolution, and we need to evolve on this planet. So that's, that's the bugaboo, that's the thing I'm trying to address today. Uh, so this building, uh, studied out with candy, uh, has been built and was the beginning of these totally uh, sustainable buildings but absolutely not marketable so I had to keep evolving it to get it. It still looks unusual let's say but it is palatable now whereas some of the early stuff like this uh, people just you know they wanted to look at it but they certainly didn't want to go in the door let alone buy it. So I kept going with all of these various experiments, compound two, uh, and keeping the building authorities aware of what I was doing, but since it's so far out in the desert, they didn't care. And again, I'm learning. I'm learning stuff. The stuff I learned here and compound one has been, is going into the things we're doing around the world now. And uh, if it weren't for the 40 years and it weren't for the accidental freedoms, I don't see how I could have evolved the building that we have now that totally takes care of people. So these are shots of that compound in, it's compound two I call it, that was out in the middle of nowhere and just took it further. Where, where today can you do that? You know, maybe none of this stuff is marketable, but it's research. Where do you get to research housing? In housing today you have to get a permit before you can build it. And to get a permit, you have to do some research. But where do you do the research? So uh, this is the issue that I'm trying to get every city in the world, really, to give people a place to do this, to provide a situation, a mechanism in the law that will allow people to progress and evolve in the methods of housing. And uh, uh, for people, uh, you know, for people just trying to build a home for their family, there should be uh, easier paths than for developers who are going to try and make money off of it and sell it. So there's two different categories there, if not more. But this compound two, again, taught us a whole lot of things. Uh, it was even, this compound was in National Geographic. Uh, you know, they happened to show up to film it. Uh, right when I was having uh, my third wedding. Um, but they, they, there was interest. There was interest from major news media about this, but more from a quirky level, uh, not from we need this level, which is where we're at now. So this is compound two, and it served its purpose. Again, it was kind of an accident, but I did know that I needed to go a little further out to get into the, these kind of things on the horizon because you know you can get arrested for some of this. So this taught us a lot uh, with the, for instance this windmill you know I'm doing things like this windmill worked so well that it was taking off. I had to build a building around it to keep it from leaving the ground. You know you don't you don't plan that stuff and tell the building authorities that that's the situation. But you do learn from it. And this is the first place where we started growing bananas in the desert. So the compound two served its purpose. But it was strange looking on the horizon. So now we have compound three. Now this time I actually planned it. And you know, you have to be alive a long time to have this many compounds. So I'm old. Uh, but uh, this one, we, we took a challenge on, really. We looked at land up halfway up this mountain, and nobody wanted it. It was cheap, and people said I was an idiot for buying it because you can't get water up there. You can't de deal with sewage up there. You can't get power up there. <coughs> I wanted to illustrate that you can do all of these things, and you can do them without corporations, without government, without anything. So we took this challenge on. We made drawings of what we planned to do up there, and they laughed at us, and we did it anyway. So this is a community. Uh, I actually, at this point, I went to the state authorities in New Mexico, and they 
they gave me permission, believe it or not, to do this. They, it was a letter uh, that just said, you know, you have three years, you can do whatever you want up there. Because, you know, you're, you're an idiot at, you know, for even trying to do something up there. And the, the only bad part about that was they gave me three years and I took 30. And uh, they also all died, you know, within the next decade or so. And here I am up there breaking every rule in the book. And so it kind of left me hanging to some extent. But, again, we learned. We were able to learn. And I'm saying the first two were accidental. This was sort of almost planned to learn. And that's what the authorities said. They said, you know, go for it, Michael. Uh, somebody's got to do it. You know, I obviously wasn't trying to make money because nobody wants to buy any of this stuff at this point. Uh, but I'm learning. I'm learning how to make a building, a home for this planet, for all kinds of people that will take care of those people without a nuclear power plant, without putting sewage into the sea and the bays and the rivers. And so that's what we're learning. So this is the... The third compound, banana trees growing at, uh, what, 3,000 meters. And again, learning about harvesting water, learning about harvesting power, learning about growing food, thermal mass refrigerators that don't, that store cold temperature. Uh, just learning. And again, these three compounds play into the bag of tricks that we have now to, to make these buildings that I showed in the beginning uh, to take around the world and try to address the six issues that really every city and country is having to deal with. So these learning compounds really did pay off. Extreme situations. So we go from this learning compound to uh, the, actually in this learning compound, this is a realtor actually bought a house in that compound. We knew then that we were at least penetrating the real world. Uh, and we're learning that they've got to be, they can't look like they landed, you know. It took me like 20 years to figure that out. But they can't look like they landed. They have to start looking like what people are used to. and then you'll get more people interested, wanting to do it. People don't want to change from the way things look, even though it may save their life. So then I take it further. This is a community on 650 acres in New Mexico that we buy, and I fight for 10 years. I have to say, you have to be old to have done this. I fight for 10 years to get them to approve a subdivision of land a development with no utilities. You know, you can imagine that fight. It's like an ant trying to lift a school bus. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling these people, the authorities in New Mexico, I want to do a whole development, 130 homes. I don't want to provide them water. I don't want to provide them power. I don't want to provide sewage. You know, I don't even want to provide roads. So I fought for 10 years. I won the ability to do that. But, you know, it cost lots of almost being in jail and lots of things like that. And we got a community approved, a subdivision approved that, that I had to present these buildings that I was able to learn how to do because of all these research compounds when they said, how are you going to provide water for the people? I said, I'm already doing it all over the world. How are you going to provide power for the people? I'm already doing it. Each home in a decentralized way provides everything for everybody. And they finally said, you know, this is logical. Let's, let's, let's let this guy do this. So um, these are just the, the way the land is divided up in this community. I always like this because the lots are not touching each other. They're round. So half of the land is still for the animals and the plants and the bugs and the reptiles that used to live there. And this is just illustration of that. The animals still live there. We're not blocking them out. Like a, in this community, a herd of 60 elk walk through it, you know, two or three times a month, like they own it, which they do. So these are buildings in the research community that is now legitimized and legal, 10 years of fighting for it. So that proves something. That proves if you've got 10 years to invest, then you can get something approved. Who has 10 years to invest these days 
um, you know, the world could be unlivable in 10 years. We need change faster, we need evolution faster. And that's what, again, I'm talking about. Uh, these are various buildings in this, and in, in parts of development in this community. Uh, this was an old gravel pit in the 650 acres that we reclaimed and, and started filling it full of these kind of buildings. I mean, there's so much more depth to all of these uh, research situations. But this one was actually legitimized, fought for, and still, still not enough. You know, by not enough, I mean, am I going to go out there and tell the rest of the world, okay, if you fight for 10 years, you can do a sustainable development. Who's going to do that? You know, no, nobody's going to even think about that. So it, it was good, but it was bad. So at this point, then, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see what I'm talking to you about now. I went to the New Mexico legislature and I said, New Mexico is the state that blew 10,000 acres to smithereens and contaminated it for 200,000 years to test the atomic bomb so that we could bomb Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. I was born on Nagasaki Day, by the way. Uh, if we can blow 10,000 acres to smithereens for testing a weapon of nuclear mass destruction, why can't we take a few acres here in New Mexico, guys, and test sustainable housing in the interest of international security? Because we're getting kind of insecure here on this planet. And they laughed me out of the, the, the legislative house the first year. And they started, you know, after I turned a few desks upside down on top of the legislators, the second and third years, they started taking me a little more seriously. And finally, the fourth year, they passed it just to get me out of there. But we have an act. An act, uh, and they, they helped with the language. They also helped water it down. But it's relating to the conservation of natural resources enacting the Sustainable Development Testing Site Act providing for the approval of areas to be used for non-industrial research and testing designed to reduce the consumption of and dependence on natural resources by residential development. It's a law in New Mexico. And the law, I've given this text to a lot of other states and a lot of other countries, it makes it legal, it, it designates a place. In our case, we just got two acres, but we got two acres legally to test however we wanted, like I was doing in the decades before, only this time legitimized. What I'm saying there is what's to stop any city from designating three or four or five small couple of hectare places to test, but not only to test, in a metropolitan area to show, to, to have people tour through it. Uh, you know, then they've got it, all your safety and insurance issues and everything. Well, in our case, we just have people sign a release before they set foot on the grounds. Uh, but it, we have in New Mexico now a law and we have a sustainable testing site signed by Governor Bill Richardson. And actually when I went in to him to try to get support for this law, uh, I went in and I started to give my whole spiel about it and he had heard about all these other compounds that we had done up there and the, the testing that we had done and he stopped me and he said look I know what you're doing up there I think you're on to something and I'm like you know wow uh, and he, he said I'll sign your law and so you know I'm at this point about to pass out <laughs> and then he says what do you want and I I didn't want anything I just saw white light when he said, what do you want? And then uh, I did, you know, wake up enough to say, okay, I need a half million dollars for a new education facility because ours is old. And that's what I'm saying here. To have a, a building that illustrates all of these things that people can walk in and see videos and, and drawings and posters and and they can experience water from the sky, they can experience uh, electricity from the sun, they can experience contained sewage treatment systems. Seeing is believing. And so what I'm saying is why can't every city uh, designate a few places around where research is being done and then people can tour it. And this is an education for the entire metropolitan area and it's a demonstration and uh, it 
it will cause us to have at least a chance to evolve fast enough. But, so after, it took me four years, you know, to get this law passed. I would never do it again. But uh, it did get passed. And then I start seeing there, that's not good enough. Everything I almost succeed at, I see it's not good enough. And uh, it's not good enough to have great text for a law that's going to take somebody four years in the legislative parliament, whatever, to get passed. We don't have four years. So then I was advised by one of the advisors of the governor that the, there is a law, a, a, it's on the books, it's a statute, it's whatever uh, is in uh, every country has it. Uh, it's called executive order. And the executive order is the same thing as the law that took four years, but it's just, it's it, it, a, a governor, a premier, a president can do an executive order in 15 minutes. They can write it up and say, this is how it's going to be, folks. They can do that. They have that power. All they have to do is have the guts to do it. Uh, they do do it for quarantines. They do do it for, uh, you know, things that happen that are for the safety of the people after some kind of a holocaust or earthquake or whatever. They make an executive order. This is the way we're going to, this has to be. All I'm saying with this, without getting into all of the text, is uh, you could make executive orders. The, 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 the governors, the mayors, even governors and mayors have it. Premiers have it. You can make executive orders to say simple things like if a, if a man is wanting to make a home for his family, then he gets uh, the red carpet, uh, a green, a sustainable home for his family. If somebody's willing to attempt that, um, and they're not trying to sell it, they're not doing it for profit, they're just making a home for their family, they get red carpeted through the permitting process, they get help. Right now you go into any city in the world, uh, except here because we just met with the council the other day and they were actually wind in our sails, really, um, without committing anything yet, but we have to perform. But what I'm usually used to is seeing people go to to councils and permit departments and planning offices and just get, you know, just get beat in the head uh, for doing something green and sustainable. And that why, how are we going to evolve that way? It's, we have made it hard for ourselves. All I'm saying with these executive orders, and they work, they're, they're legal, is make it easy for, for humans to exist on this planet. Uh, so that's that's like what we have gone into from accidental uh, accidental research compounds all the way to legitimized communities to laws being passed to recognizing that there's not time for laws to be passed anymore and to make executive orders toward green sustainable development appropriate technology on on how buildings are built and how people live on this planet an executive order is really simple it just it's whereas 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 and you talk about all the things that are not right and you say it is ordered and they can do it on two pages and bush i went through the uh, the the webs uh, the googled all these executive orders and every president, every premier, they've all done it for all kinds of Mickey Mouse things. I mean, George Bush did about a hundred of them, you know, for little things like making his ranches better and, and getting oil uh, rights and whatever. But they have the power to do this for green and sustainable development. It's available to us. Uh, we're asking to, we're trying to point out to legislative bodies that you can make it easier for the people to take care of themselves in a green and sustainable way. And that's, that's where we are now. So we, we have one more step in this. The sustainable testing site law that we got passed, we spent, believe it or not, another two years getting it through our county because they didn't know what to do with it, even though the state mandated it. They had to like vote and think and, and everything on how to to manifest it, and they did. And so now in our 650-acre experimental community, we have little two acres down here where literally we can do anything we want unless it's build a nuclear power plant. 
We can build anything we want. We can use any kind of electricity, any kind of sewage, any kind of water, uh, unless we're trying to pollute the water tables or something like that. But very minimal. We're loose on the streets, so to speak, there. We, they parred it down from 20 acres to two, but now other people can do this in New Mexico. Colorado is interested in it. Lots of other states are interested in it and countries. The law is written. I have the text of the law. If anybody wants it, I have a PDF file of the law, uh, you know, like 10 pages of uh, the things that the legislators point out to just cover themselves, uh, but it is a law and it does work. So this is the two acres that we were able to deal with. What it turns out is that we have a road, we, the green buildings are already existing. They're becoming a part of this research. The new buildings are being built. We're connecting them all with an Amazon jungle rainforest greenhouse, which we've already done and illustrated to them with, you can fish for fish in these things. You, the birds are flying around. Uh, bananas are growing, strawberries are growing, frogs are on the trees. I mean, it's in the desert, but it's, it's making an oasis in the desert on two acres and it's for 25 people to live there and it's underway, it's happening. And it only took, what, uh, 40 years of research and lawmaking and everything like that to make this happen. I'm saying that it should be easier and I'm actually pointing out legitimate ways for, with laws and executive orders to make it easier uh, so that people can do this all over the world. And this is, uh, this community that we call uh, EVE, Earthship Village Ecologies. And yeah, lots of people might do it different, but it's really aimed at using products that we throw away in this world. So we, we use aluminum cans, you know, all over the place because they're great bricks, they don't wear out. We use glass bottles for, uh, for stained glass effects. This is the sign. We have a warning sign. This is an official USA sustainable testing site, you know, and it's legal. So that it's, for a, it's a compound for 25 people, legitimized, where, where research can take place for 10 years. And it will be housing people in a very, very economical way and letting everybody participate in their own sustenance. And, uh, and yes, other people might do this in a lot more conservative way. They might even not even use garbage, if that's what you want to call it. I use it because it's in abundance everywhere. And actually, if somebody paid me $30 million to invent the best building material I could, I'd invent tires and cans and bottles because they're, they're great. Uh, and we have a school now, an academy has emerged from all of this. And it teaches people all of these things. Uh, the concept, the physics, the techniques, and the law so that this can be taken out there into the world. This is under construction, but this will be palm trees and banana trees. And it'll be, you know, we've done it. We have buildings that have this. Uh, fish ponds, birds flying around. This is in the desert of New Mexico. To get a permit for this, you know, is impossible but this is on the test site. And so this is really the, the, the issue is, it's not, I haven't really shown you tooth and nail how these buildings work other than to say that they address these issues. Because the, the issue, prevailing issue, beyond the functionality and the biotech, the biology and the physics of these buildings is the mechanism to allow people to evolve. And that's basically what we're trying to point out here. Uh, we were, were able to develop this vertical axis windmill, uh, quiet and produces power, and simple enough that you can make in your own town. Uh, this technology has made its way to Manhattan. This is Midtown Manhattan. Uh, these are the vertical axis windmills and solar panels, and this is a global model Earthship, um, and they need it in Mid Midtown Manhattan. The council has twice given it the nod. We're trying to get the money together now. Uh, this is where it's evolving to, uh, but in a place like New York that wouldn't have considered this 10 years ago, they're desperate now after that hurricane. 
They didn't have water. They didn't have power. They didn't have sewage. Uh, they didn't have a life. They got really scared, and they're looking now. This situation brings in the sun, hits an 80-foot long by 15-foot tall mirror, and shoots it down into the global model earthship. It's radical, but they're, go they're ready to go radical in New York City. And one other thing, this, not only does this, this whole process, has it taught us methods of trying to make this available in the developed world, it has given us a lot of tricks and, and ammunition, let's say, to go all over the world. This is India after the tsunami, uh, Haiti after the earthquake, uh, Sierra Leone where they're, they're in dire straits over there, and we're actually teaching the local people some of these simple techniques. And in this case, we started this school. We built two rooms of an eight-room school, and we taught them how to finish it, and they finished it. So it's, at this point, it's becoming like a virus. But overall, through the whole thing, the thing that I see is the biggest barrier between the people of the world and, and sustenance and appropriate technology and green living is the, the web of codes and regulations that we somehow just can't get out of. Thank you.